There is a contradiction in life that has many times left me scratching my head. The fact that there are so many Christians, people who profess to be followers of Christ, who are total and complete jerks, and so many non-Christians who would have no profession whatsoever of knowing and believing in Christ, who aren't. Now, I don't have too much trouble with the fact that there's a lot of Christians who are jerks out there, because I know myself well enough to know that there is a possibility that that could be true. But what always surprises me is when you see a caliber of goodness and truth and beauty and all that is right to be a human being in someone who has no connection formally whatsoever with God. That person that you might be thinking of now who just is an outstanding human being. She just has this otherworldly kind of character which is big and right and good and true. Or that friend who loves other people and his neighbors so consistently you feel put to shame. Again and again and again, they love their neighbors as they love themselves. Or a leader in your office or politically who just consistently works for the good of all, for everyone in the city. That individual who, in my mind, is so grounded that they always see good in other people and they're not cynical and skeptical and kind of negative the way I can be. And they live in a way that trusts life and and trusts other people to live it more fully. Have you ever met somebody like that? Jesus did once, and it surprised even him when he met the Roman centurion. A story from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7. And when Jesus met him, a guy who was outside of the church the Jewish faith of that day, which Jesus was a part of, a man, that man so amazed him that Jesus said, I tell you, I've never, I've not found such great faith even in Israel, the church of his day, this outsider's faith, this outsider's goodness. Here's the story. When Jesus had finished saying all this to the people who were listening, he entered a town called Capernaum. And there a centurion's, a Roman centurion soldier, a centurion's servant, which would have been his slave, slavery was a regular part of the empire then, there a centurion's servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to ask him, asking him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, quote, This man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue, unquote. And so Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent other friends to him, saying, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. And when Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. I think we live in a world that is filled with people who have heard of Jesus in the way this centurion had heard of Jesus. And I'm not talking about people who grew up in the church or heard from a Christian friend about this person named Jesus and who he is or got a flyer in the mail from some church or saw some televangelist talk about it or took a comparative religions course in university. 
I'm thinking people who have, in a deeper way, unknowingly perhaps, known Jesus, heard him whisper to them in their consciences in that critical moment when they were looking to make a choice, felt him impress himself upon their hearts as they faced a decision about how to love someone, sensed him holding their tongues back in a supernatural way when you're the kind of person where that normally doesn't happen, laying out a path for their lives and sensing, man, there's something else going on here, maybe even knowing him in their very createdness, anonymously, Look at this centurion guy. He loved his servant and respected him so much that he went so far out of the way to try to connect with this Jesus character to save him, to heal him. God is love. Jesus Christ is love in the flesh. Whenever we see selfless love at work in our world, it is the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Jesus Christ, authoring that selfless love in that human being, whether they know it or not. Because if God is love, then all love, where it's true love, is God's love. The centurion sacrificially cared for the Jewish people to the point of building their church, their synagogue for them. Jesus cared for the Jewish people, so much so that he allowed, impressed his spirit upon this representative from the empire that was occupying his people in such a way that his heart would become generous and gracious toward the people he loved. This soldier was so aware of what is good and right and true in terms of structure and organization and the way things work, and saw that within his own life and his own job in the army, he knew the creational goodness in having the capacity to have hierarchy and get things done so well that he projected it upon his understanding of this God-man, Jesus. If a soldier can just give the word and it's done, well, then surely this man of God, Jesus, whoever he is, can do the same thing. He knew something very true about what is right in God's good creation. God is everywhere. If Jesus is of God, well, he doesn't need to touch my servant in order to heal him. If, if I can just give the word, then surely God can just give the word, and through whomever, whenever, whatever, get his healing will done. And then I think about Jesus' reaction to hearing someone who's outside of the church, the circle of faith, the Jewish people, Israel, expressing a faith and demonstrating the goodness of God in this way and hearing this for the first time. I feel like I can get Jesus' reaction, knowing where Christ had come from and knowing where he was going, knowing that he was the one through whom everything in the cosmos was made, and he is the one that everything is coming together to bring glory to and ultimately honor, knowing all of that stuff and that His Father's Spirit, that the Holy Spirit is everywhere moving in the world, authoring goodness and truth, knowing that God is a just-say-the-word kind of God, I get that Jesus would have been blown away by this guy's faith and that He would know as much as He knew. This guy can see. He's got ears and hears what is true and right and good in this world. He knows more about my Father than anyone I've met before. Truly, I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what he sees, but did not see it, and to hear what he hears, but did not hear it. What an amazing faith, this outside the church, unbelieving, 
believing centurion has. Now, I doubt that the Roman soldier ever prayed the Jesus prayer or followed those four steps or knew anything about substitutionary atonement. And yet he believed with a belief that was unparalleled. Because you have seen me, Jesus said to doubting Thomas after his resurrection, because you have seen me, you believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. Jesus is making the point that there is something about something very blessed about, just right in those who believe in him, having not seen him, which is where most of us, I trust, are. We've never seen him face to face, and yet we're believing. It's kind of like the centurion knowing something in his heart of the nature of God, innately, anonymously, however... But having faith that God would be that kind of God, and if Jesus is representing that kind of God, even though we'd never met him personally, as far as we know, never did, believing. So even as we know Jesus, having heard and not seen him, are there those outside of the church who know Jesus, having heard and not seen him, having been made by him? How can anyone not have something in them that knows something of the God who made them, the God who acts and moves by His Spirit in a mysterious, powerful, beautiful way in the world and uses to author good and truth and rightness for the city, even them? If that's true, What would it mean to live your life recognizing that fact? Would would we be amazed by people's faith were we to assign authorship to all that goodness in them to Jesus Christ? Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile, God said through the prophet. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers you too will prosper. The people of Israel, the Hebrews, were taken away to a foreign land. And God's word to them through the prophet, people in a foreign land, is work for the good of the city. Pray for the leaders of your city. Make the city a better city. And you too will prosper. And God will be honored. Those Jewish friends of the centurion in the story seem to have gotten this prophetic verse. They were an advocate for their oppressing empire Roman centurion friend. This man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. They bore witness to God's love for everybody who fills the city so much so that they would become an advocate and beg Jesus to do something good for that person's life. Even as they, in a way, are the outsiders as well. They're the Jewish people. They don't fully know who Jesus is, and yet the Spirit of God is working through them to work this good for this guy, to ultimately work this good for this servant, who we don't know from Adam. This is why I preached Nehed Nenshi a year and a half or so ago. The Spirit believing that the Spirit of Jesus Christ would raise up a mayor for a city for such a time as this to work for the good of our city through this man, an Ismaili Muslim man. And then when we preach him, kind of like the Jews praying for the centurion or helping the centurion and the servant, we're kind of honoring the mayor and our city, loving the goodness and truth in who he is and what he brings to our community by bringing it here into the synagogue and talking about it, naming it. 
The Spirit of Christ working through an Ismaili Muslim mayor in Calgary. The Spirit of Christ protecting you via the Calgary police service. I haven't preached that sermon yet, but got to preach that sermon about a God who physically protects you when you're in danger, who has a heart of laws and morals and ethics and would seek to protect you through those things. The Spirit of Christ healing you via city hospitals. Preached that sermon years ago on the Alberta Children's Hospital when it opened up. The heart of God that wants to heal you just as God wanted to heal that servant through that whole series of common grace events with the centurion. The Spirit of Christ building your church through through a national government and policies that allow for tax breaks for charitable institutions and deductions for your donations and clergy allowances for me so that I can live more cheaply and take on a job to be a pastor of a Christian church. The Spirit of Christ working through all of those things to build this, your church. Just as the Spirit of God worked through that centurion, then via those means to build that synagogue. Are we recognizing the Spirit's truth in all these places and honoring it the way those Jewish leaders did? even as they didn't know fully what they were doing. I think your life is surrounded by people through whom Christ is moving, people who Jesus has authored. And were you to have eyes to see and wear glasses of faith and have a knowledge of God through the Scriptures, you would see a glory at work and a beauty playing out and a goodness and truth with which you are surrounded like you've never seen before. And I keep imagining the Spirit of Christ knowingly in you coming along, the Spirit of Christ anonymously working all around you in your world. What an aware stepping into that place would look like and how beautiful and powerful the church could be. heaven on earth. So, these are the questions. This is where you guys can give some feedback back to me. Is that your view of the Spirit of Jesus Christ? Do you believe that the Spirit still moves in ways like this centurion story shows us? Are there lines in terms of where the Spirit of God chooses to work within the church, within Christians, but not beyond. Is that the paradigm you operate with? Is Jesus working less authoritatively when a spirit is working in common ways out in the city than when he's working in very special and close ways within the church or within a knowing believer's heart? At what point does the movement of the Holy Spirit in an unknowing world become a saving movement? Or is it always a saving movement? Or is it never a saving movement when the Spirit's working outside of Christians in the church? What do you think? This is what we're doing as a church when we preach all these crazy things we do and interacting with our world. How do you respond to it? Please text me. I have no way to really land this thing. Uh, My notes kind of end with that last put up the texting number. Okay, we got a couple of texts. I have a big God. He has no bounds or limitations. Who am I to say how He works or who He works through? God in the Bible even spoke through an ass, right? Those of, uh, those of us who are on staff know exactly how that joke is meant to play out. 
When asked about other non-followers who were healing people, Jesus said to judge by the fruit of their efforts. So things were happening outside of Jesus' direct ministry where people were being delivered of demons and being healed. And Jesus says, judge by the fruits of your neighbor or your coworker or your friend. How can there be lines for the Holy Spirit? But we can limit the results. I spent a lot of time with our denomination in meetings in Grand Rapids, and the Christian Reformed Church historically is very discerning and thoughtful and high on process and good order. And I said at the meeting this week, we are all a bunch of control freaks in the Christian Reformed Church. And if you're nodding, saying, yeah, that Christian Reformed Church, they're control freaks. They are. You are too, and so am I. And how does that work in terms of letting the Spirit really move in power in your life and in the church? To believe in a Spirit that's moving everywhere through all things, you know, understanding that there's sin and brokenness, but still that big of a Spirit is out of control. Perhaps the movement of the Holy Spirit is always saving by its nature. Bill Lindemolder sent this, but apparently it was Meg, his wife, who he's pointing to, who wrote this. So you don't agree with this point, Bill? You have no thoughts. Perhaps, perhaps the movement of the Holy Spirit is always saving by its nature. It's whether or not we see Him and receive that. You know, you, you, get, you risk being called a universalist, right? Or somebody who believes that God wants to save everybody and is. But how can the Spirit of God moving in authoring a good deed through your next-door neighbor who has no faith whatsoever, how can that be? If it's the Spirit of God, it's a personal spirit. How can it not be a saving of the city, a saving of that person in some way? And I understand that there's a difference between that and kind of knowing Christ as your personal Savior and appropriating that, which I believe with all of my heart you need to know too. But it has to be saving. God is so big, His Spirit can focus and pay attention to everything in or outside of the church. Okay, now, whoever sent that, if you believe that's true, then what does that mean when you go to work later today or tomorrow? Are you listening accordingly? Are you, through the doing of your geophysics or your medicine or your studenting or your homemaking or your teaching or your learning, believing that through this lesson, God is saying something. Through my history course, God is saying something. Through my serving in the office this way, God is saying this today. Where is God's Spirit whispering now and now and now? I think all I can do is, I think all I do is limit God and compartmentalize. courtesy of a membership of your leadership team. All I do, all I do, Brandon, with you is limit and compartmentalize. Doesn't the Holy Spirit work through everyone? Maybe those who show it are the ones who are listening to it, maybe without even knowing it. We had a leadership team meeting uh, month and a half ago, and we're dreaming about the future of New Hope Church, and one of the dreams and the thing that I brought forward was um, I would love to spend the next three to five years diving more and more deeply into what it means to know God at work. Um, there's a Latin phrase called Lectio Divina that an old Christian thinker uh, brought to the idea of reading the Bible, and you kind of wait on the word of the text, and you listen for God's Spirit to illumine something in the written words for you, that beyond the sacred page, you're looking for an experience, a mystical moment with God, 
Um, what would it mean to do Lectio on your life? Every flight, every lesson, every moment with your son, every bit of code, every bit of love for your granddaughter. I believe Jesus works everywhere authoritatively. However, it's easier for me to climb a mountain and after seeing the view say, hey, that's neat, as opposed to saying, wow, God is awesome, when really that's the message being practically screamed at me. These people who follow Jesus Christ, God incarnate, who we can assume got it right all the time, didn't know who they were walking with, many of them. No question about the authority of his word. No question about the perspicuity of what he's saying. No question of his being right there, right then, authoring that truth to them through that parable, through that healing. And people did not see what was right in front of them. Do you see what I'm saying? You hear this? We evidently have a cloaking mechanism, <laughs> not to keep people from seeing us, but a blinding propensity, uh, theologians would say, sinful disposition that thwarts our vision, runs interference to our hearing, blinds us to his truth and presence. Said to Chuck a hundred times in the last ten years, if this crazy vision that we're willing to crash our lives on and a church if necessary is really going to ever work, then the Holy Spirit needs to open our eyes and give us hearts that are soft enough to believe like this centurion, this innate understanding of the goodness of God in this world and through his word and So, maybe we ought to pray for that. Sometimes, God, we are uh, put to shame by faith, a faith that surrounds our lives and is alive and moving and present in this world. where uh, we should be the people of all people. We're walking with you. We're reading your stories. We're hearing your words. We're praying to you. We should be most alive, most at work creating culture and goodness and truth in your world, authoring those things. seems we're stuck as uh, mere human beings, frail mortals, in this conundrum of this catch-22 um, of, of wanting more and being unable to do more and yet wanting to do what's right and to see you more clearly and follow you and feel you and doing the exact opposite, behaving in ways that are so contrary and fall short to a people living in that reality uh, we ask you to show your face We need uh, to see you and to uh, know you more, to hear your word, to feel your touch, your embrace. Uh, 
many of us maybe need it, just most all of us need it, just to survive. But uh, we certainly need it also to uh, restore a city and renew a world and to be as active and alive and empowered in your kingdom work as we're called to be. So, like you did for the blind people you healed and the deaf who you healed, just uh, spit in their eyes and restore them and touch their ears, our ears, and heal us. We pray in your name, Jesus, and in the name of the Father, your Father, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen.